I'm Bob Lackey, professor of fisheries at Oregon State University, and I've been working on salmon for a half a century. Uh, the salmon decline in the Pacific Northwest, including British Columbia and Alaska, is not a new phenomena. Uh, we've had four, we have four populations of salmon worldwide, and they all have followed the same general pattern. And those populations of salmon are on the west coast of North America, the ones we're talking about, uh, the east coast of North America, uh, Europe, and the Asian Far East. They've all followed the same general decline pattern. And that is, as the human population grew in those areas, economic development took place, land use changed, there was all kinds of human activities, the salmon populations declined. In those areas where there's been relatively little human action, uh, the Asian Far East and Northern half, which is Russia and that area, uh, populations of salmon are doing fabulous. In the uh, European area, the northern parts of Norway, Finland, uh, around the Russian area, uh, those populations are also doing fine. Lots of salmon, few people. If you go over to eastern North America, the lower half of the distribution of salmon, which was the United States primarily, uh, those populations are essentially gone. In the Maritimes of Canada, there are still reasonable populations of salmon, but they're much reduced. Same pattern, as the human development took place in those areas, the salmon population declined. Now, our part of the world, which is Western, <coughs> Western North America, is following the same general pattern. The northern half of the distribution, which is mid-British Columbia to northern British Columbia through Alaska, populations are really doing fine. They're about, roughly speaking, historic averages. If you go in the lower half of the distribution, which is mid-British Columbia southward, down through California, they're much reduced. They run on the average in the lower 48, California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, about 3% of historic numbers. So the run, runs right now are about less than a 20th of what they've been historically. British Columbia runs, generally speaking, are about 20% of what they were historically. Much reduced, but still substantial. About 80% of the run is composed of hatchery fish, not wild fish. So hatcheries support wild sal these salmon runs, and without the hatcheries, you probably wouldn't have much runs. And that's generally the pattern. It varies by river, but it's generally the pattern. The run size in the lower 48 was about, historically, was about 50 million fish. Right now, it's about 3 million wild fish. So it's much, much reduced, but still substantial. Well, I can speak to the salmon issue and the decline of what would it take. And many of those stocks or runs are listed as either threatened or endangered in the U.S. under the Endangered Species Act, or several of them are listed under the Canadian Species at Risk Act. So several are listed as either threatened or endangered. The simplest way to bring them back would be to reduce the human footprint. And if you reduce the human footprint, you come back to habitat environments. It's very idealized for salmon. Uh, so that's the, the technical solution is relatively simple. Now, politically, it's very difficult to do. Uh, people don't want to give up their hot showers, lose their hydropower, for example. They don't tend to want to lose their roads. They don't want to uh, lose their schools because those are oftentimes built on salmon habitat. Uh, they don't want to uh, lose their ski resorts because those are oftentimes adversely affecting salmon areas. So irrigated agriculture probably would have to go away because that has an adverse effect on salmon. Basically everything that humans do adversely affects wild salmon. Uh, should all fishing cease? Is so all fishing cease is a common question. And I would ask, turn it around and say, what do you want? If you want to sustain runs of wild salmon, why are you even doing hatcheries? You ought to close hatcheries, period. Close hatcheries, eliminate fishing of all types, and try to bring back wild salmon to the level that you can. That is purely a political call. Technically, if you say, I want my top priority, my only priority is to bring back wild salmon, you probably have to do that. Now, does society want to do that? Yeah, I can't say. I'm, I'm really skeptical, except for these isolated cases where you have engineering issues, that a significant culling of marine mammals of any type is going to have a big effect on s salmon runs over the long term. Short run, you can have anybody can have effects, but over the long term, the problems that they have, I don't think, are predation primarily. There are other things, habitat particularly. And so the predation issue is not trivial, uh, but on a scale of things, it's not among the major ones. Now, what does have an effect are a lot of the other species that are doing well. For example, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, walleyes, and so forth. 
I mean, all these non-native species that are prospering, they harvest a lot. They, they prey on a lot of salmon. So what are you going to do about that society? I mean, you've got these, these fish that are perfectly adapted to the current habitat. They're prospering. How are you going to keep them from preying on salmon, which are not perfectly adapted to the current habitat? That's a tough question. You end up with these culls like with pike minnows, and you know it's not entirely clear they do any good at all. And how would you determine how many seals or sea lions could be killed without having adverse effects on other species or the ecosystem as a whole? Uh, with incredible, incredible difficulty, you would have to approach a study like that because knowing the number that could be a number of predators that could be taken and what effect they would have on the population means you have to understand the salmon population enough to know what a change in predation rate would do. We can't even predict salmon runs one year to the next. I mean, that's a pretty low bar to clear. We cannot even tell you with any kind of confidence what the salmon run will be next year or the year after or the year after. And so to know what would be the effect of increasing one small piece of mortality would do on the run is very difficult. I think it'd be extremely difficult. Does that mean when people talk about taking out the dams, what you're really saying is, I want to bring back the floods. And I'm telling you, politically, that's a hard sell. We've had some terrible floods here, and if you say take out the dams and bring the floods back, that's going to be a tough sell politically. If you say, I want to close the hatcheries and just go to wild fish, then all these people that fish right now, including tribes, recreational, commercial, are not going to be kept fishing that's a tough sell. Or I say, we've got to bring the habitat back to 1850, all the irrigated agriculture goes away. Not going to be an easy sell. Or we've got to reduce the number of people here because the Seattle's, Portland's of the world have basically filled in the area. That's a tough sell. So these things are a tough choice. Either winners and losers are clear, and losers don't want to be losers. I think the current, current strategy has enough support to keep going. And the current strategy is no major change for society. Just kind of rock along. We're not going to bring the floods back. We're going to keep the electricity on. We're not going to bulldoze out your backyard because it's prime salmon habit was prime salmon habitat. We're not going to plow up downtown Portland because it used to be called it used to be a salmon stream there. We're not going to do that. We'll keep the runs going with hatcheries. Maybe some people say not ideal, but we'll keep them going. Uh, we'll do the best we can with relatively no hassle for wild fish. That's kind of the current muddling through policy. Nothing wrong with it. It seems to have political support, but it's not doing what a lot of people would like. Um, what are the best ways to ensure healthy fisheries for the future? Well, I would say the best simple way is to uh, adjust your fishing uh, targets to climate <clears throat> because oceans change. Uh, the terrestrial climate is changing. Whether how much is due to human cause is not the issue. The fact that climate does change tremendously. If you look at the last 2,000 years of climate change, we've in the medieval warm period, for example, from roughly the year 800 to about 13 or 1400, salmon essentially disappeared from California because it was too warm. No surprise. Now, when at the cool times, the uh, little ice age, salmon came back to California. And they will come back, they will ebb and flow depending on climatic conditions. We are warming now, and so you can't expect to run your salmon fisheries the way it was in 1850. Not going to happen. Uh, basically, habitat consists of, well, this habitat is, is the so-called freshwater or terrestrial habitat in contrast to the ocean habitat. The ocean habitat you don't really have a big effect on, it's just there. It does vary because you have El Nino climatic events, natural cycles. So ocean habitat does vary, no question about it. But terrestrial habitat, you could conceivably do something about. Those are primarily water flow, both quantity and quality, uh, dams, alterations, irrigation systems, anything that will alter the volume of water. Or in the case of heavily dammed rivers like the Columbia, it alters the flow. So what you have in the Columbia is you've got a hydrograph, the discharge that's flat over the year, essentially. In the old days, we had big floods, typically, in May. We don't have those big floods, generally speaking, because the reservoirs can store a lot of water. That's great if you want to avoid floods. It's not great for wild salmon. They tend to migrate to the ocean during the flood time, and when you have dams there, it alters the hydrograph, and salmon have to adjust.
and they don't suggest well. Other species adjust much better. In 1848, with the discovery of gold in California, the miners, of course, uh, used sluicing techniques to mine for gold. There was tremendous amounts of tailings. Those tailings were distributed in lots of places, and invariably they started sluicing for gold in salmon streams. They also needed animal protein to survive. They harvested large numbers of salmon in the late 1840s and 1850s, and those salmon runs were decimated. The land in the Central Valley of California has tremendously altered from what it was in 1850, pre-1850, and it's not ever going to come back to what it was uh, in the foreseeable future. Though in 1848, with the discovery of gold in California, the miners, of course, uh, used sluicing techniques to mine for gold. There was tremendous amounts of tailings. Those tailings were distributed in lots of places, and invariably they started sluicing for gold in salmon streams. They also needed animal protein to survive. They harvested large numbers of salmon in the late 1840s and 1850s, and those salmon runs were decimated. The land in the Central Valley of California has tremendously altered from what it was in 1850, pre-1850, and it's not ever going to come back to what it was uh, in the foreseeable future. Those salmon runs, those wild salmon runs in California, <coughs> Central Valley, are essentially gone. Uh, there's a few residual fish, and of course there's some other fish from hatcheries. Uh, you see the same pattern along the coast of North America, starting in the coast of California, heavy industrial fishing in the 1870s, moving up through Washington, British Columbia, eventually hitting Alaska in the, in the 1890s, Heavy industrial fishing did a number on salmon, much reduced and very selective for certain species and certain sizes. And so right now you have a situation where you have tremendously altered land, you have tremendous demands on a finite supply of water, you have tremendous irrigation requirements, you have tremendous use for water for other purposes, you have things like roads, housing, schools, other, all the other things that humans do cause effects on salmon. Damon, dams are certainly not a salmon's best friends, but they're just one of many of the effects uh, that we see that affect salmon runs. There are a couple of complications with the long-term decline of wild salmon. <clears throat> Those complications are really focused on changes in climate. Uh, the, warm, the climate right now is a lot warmer than it was in 1850. Uh, Pre-1850, salmon were not heavily utilized in terms of harvest. And we have a situation now, we've got warmer climate, warmer waters, we have a lot of alteration of habitat, primarily through dam construction, road construction, diversions, and so forth. This has created an aquatic environment which is ideal for certain species of fish, but not for salmon. So we have a lot of non-native species, the American shad, the walleye, the smallmouth bass, the largemouth bass. These species are doing fabulously well, but wild salmon are not. So we have a situation where fish in general are doing quite well. It's just the fact that the salmon species are not. Algae blooms are really a function of water quality issues. When you have nutrients in relatively high levels, you're going to get algae blooms. It's like any other water quality challenge. It's not ideal from a salmon perspective. Uh, and so it's just one of many, many factors uh, in the process that cause problems for wild salmon, or hatchery salmon for that matter. Other, th other complications are primarily irrigation, which takes tremendous quantities of water from the Central Valley of California and the interior of the uh, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia area. And that irrigation water, ten irrigation tends to warm the water, which creates less than optimal habitat for wild salmon. And of course, you have general water quality problems. Obviously, if the water is taken out, it warms up, it's used, gets fertilizer and other kinds of things you've got a general lowering of the water quality from a salmon perspective. Great for other species, but not for salmon, which tend to demand relatively clean, high quality, cold water. Other species thrive on a warmer water, more a luxuriant water, more uh, eutrophic water, uh, but salmon do not. So it's not surprising that other species of fish are doing well and salmon are not. Water quality is, of course, a big issue with wild salmon, <clears throat> and the water quality has pro are problems that from a lot of different locations. One of the greatest water quality problems are urban areas, particularly just the alteration of the flow of water, the use of water for other kinds of things, sewer treatment plants, runoff from lawns, and so forth, uh, all kinds of chemicals used to either herbicides or fertilizers. None of these things are beneficial from a salmon perspective, or any other species of aquatic organism for that matter.
Uh, those are particularly common in urban areas. They're also common in heavily farmed areas, uh, particularly areas where you have a lot of irrigation water. None of those things do any good for salmon either. So you have a situation where basically any of human activities is going to cause some degree of adverse effect on wild salmon or salmon generally. I would say the biggest, in general terms, the biggest problems, the biggest problems that salmon have are generally speaking, not things that kill them directly, except for fishing, obviously. Uh, it's things that basically cause them not to prosper. And they're competing with an introduced species, all these competitors out there who are living in a perfect environment from their perspective. So if you're competing with smallmouth bass, walleye, largemouth bass, bluegills, uh, so forth, they're doing great because the habitat is perfect for them. Salmon are struggling because the habitat's no longer, including water quality, no longer ideal for them. And so they're competing basically on a not a very level playing field. Coupled with the fact that the climate is much is warmer now than it was 150 years ago, and so it's just not ideal climate for wild salmon, or, or hatchery salmon for that matter, but you don't expect them to survive multiple generations. Well, another factor relative to wild salmon is uh, predation, and predation comes in a variety of different ways. Uh, some of the immediate predation on younger salmon are things like largemouth and smallmouth bass, and they will, act, they will get a large number of those fish, but of course, uh, the survival rate's always very low in these species, and so you kind of expect that. Marine mammals <clears throat> of a variety of different species will take a lot of salmon too, <clears throat> especially in situations where the engineering, the dam construction, the fish passage, the bridges constricts the runs of wild salmon or any salmon. Uh, the marine mammals, particularly the seal sea lions, can do a number on those. In the open ocean, when you get changing current, which you naturally do, you can get some serious predators come up from the south, uh, depending on what the temperatures are, like pike or uh, uh, mackerels and things like this. They'll eat a lot of salmon too. And so as the ocean conditions evolve due to El Nino and other kinds of oceanic events, you will get a lot of predators that will come in. This is natural in part uh, because these fish are subjected to all kinds of predators and they've been around for thousands of years and survived this. So this is not unusual, uh, but depending on what year it is and what the ocean conditions are, there can be relatively high predation rates. Talk about fish farm fish or hatchery fish. There's three kinds of salmon, farmed, which are totally separate, those are like chickens and then there's hatcheries which are grown to be released and then there's wild. So uh, the, uh, a lot of people will say that actually hatchery fish will get, they get perfect nutrition, they're fed regularly, they don't have to compete, they, at the same time of the year, they're bigger than wild fish growing in the wild. Having said that, wild fish have to survive by escaping predators in the wild and so they become more wary. Now whether they're healthy or not, I mean I don't know anything one way or the other on that, uh, but most of the run these days around here, lower 48, is hatchery fish. Uh, sea lice, uh, you know, sea lice is one issue. Actually, uh, you can make the case that uh, fish farming uh, could be a problem too, uh, because you know they do escape periodically and so forth, and so there could be some issues there. I don't think on a scale of things it's a big thing, but none of these things help salmon. Is that most of the salmon that we have out there in the lower 48 are actually from hatcheries. And so these really aren't expected to survive other than to be, go out in the ocean to be caught. And so from a ham, hatchery perspective is salmon going out being caught is a success. <clears throat> and obviously some, some of those come back to spawn and that's ideal. <clears throat> but the reality of life is that uh, we don't expect them to survive long. The question basically of the role of fish hatcheries in salmon management is a controversial one. If you want to maintain the runs at what we call fishable levels, you're going to have to use hatcheries at the lower 48 and to a lesser extent in southern British Columbia. You just cannot maintain the runs at fishable levels with natural recruitment, except in certain situations. Having said that, if you want to use hatcheries to supplement the runs or maintain the runs, that's a political call. I mean, it technically is doable. They've done it in Japan for many, many decades. It's definitely technically doable, but there's a cost. And the cost is it's not going to help wild salmon at all, in my opinion. This is where hatcheries are. And look what the hatcheries are. High density in lower 48 BC. These are uh, supplemental hatcheries in Alaska and lots of hatcheries in Japan. Their wild salmon are essentially gone. And actually, Japan has done managed their fisheries for almost 100 years.
using this technique. So you can sustain runs with hatchery fish, but the cost of that is, uh, is a very great pressure on wild fish. They're interchangeable, but the problem is, is if you allow fishing on hatchery fish, you will catch some of the much less abundant wild fish. And so when you have differential mortality, it's a so-called mixed stock problem. And when the stocks mix, and they're interchangeable, you know, they look the same, they're the same in every regard, you can't easily, unless they're marked by fin clipping, you can't tell the difference between wild fish and hatchery fish. And while the wild fish are rare, relatively rare, you don't want to catch those. Uh, but if they're mixed with hatchery stocks, you can't tell the difference. Uh, Seals and sea lions can cause problems in limited areas where you have a constricted run. For example, they have to go through a channel, a fish passage area, perhaps a uh, overpass to a, a road, uh, someplace below a dam that you have a fishway where they can just congregate. They can have a, a significant measurable effect on the salmon runs. It's not among the major effects on the salmon runs, but it is a measurable effect. In the open ocean, in areas where you don't have these engineering constructions, I think the effect of seals and sea lions would be limited. It would just be one of many effects on a salmon run. However, in some areas, you can have a limited effect if, you, the, if the run of salmon can be concentrated and then the animals, the, the predators can get to them. Be able to quantify that at all, like what kind of effect? No, I think it's in a low single digits percentage wise. I mean, it's one of many things that happen out there, and none of these things you can say for sure, because first of all, you don't have the same climate as you had in 1850, so all things being equal, you'd have very different runs. Secondly, you have tremendously altered habitats, both in flow, quantity, and everything else, and you've got, in the lower 48 in these four states here, you've got 15 million people, whereas historically you had less than a million people. So you've got 15 times more million people at a much, much higher standard of living, and everything that we collectively do causes problems for salmon. So. Humans are the biggest predator by far. You know, humans, the, the predation, the, the biggest single thing I think that causes problems for salmon is not the predation by humans or anything else. It's the fact that the habitat that they live in is just so different than it was pre-1850. It's just not the same habitat. If you looked at the 1850 habitat and looked at the habitat now, you'd say, Wow, how can we even have any salmon here? The habitat's just so different. And not only that, is you're on a trajectory in the four states up here, including British Columbia, you're on a trajectory to go from 14 or 15 million people to 65 million people by the end of the century. So right now you have, say, roughly 15 million people in these three states, one province, and by 2100 you'll have roughly 65 million people, four times more. Now, having said that, you tell me how salmon are going to survive and prosper with four times more people, conceivably multiple times more development, more demands on water, more demands on transport, housing, schools, everything. All those things cause adverse effects of wild salmon. I think actually the bigger predation problem, I mean the one that they go after around here <clears throat> is the old squawfish northern pike minnow because that's a native species but they prey on salmon. So they actually uh, the agencies will give a bounty on this fish species because they prey on salmon. Now there's been a lot of studies on whether that does any good at all for the salmon run. I think generally speaking, it, it, at best the jury is out on it, whether it actually makes a difference or not. And a northern pike minnow can consume a lot of salmon. They're very, very efficient predators and they're efficient because the habitat is altered in the Columbia and they congregate around dams. Pre-dams, they were not great predators. Uh, salmon could avoid them pretty easily, but with dams they cannot. And so the pike minnows have done extremely well. Same issue with uh, actually with seals and sea lions is the fact that they can congregate around dams, particularly fishways, uh, and they can get a good number of salmon that way. I mean, if people always ask me, uh, I get this question all the time, let's bring back wild salmon to the Pacific Northwest. Technically a very doable problem, not a challenge at all, very simple. Get rid of the people, Go back to conditions in 1850 and salmon will prosper. I have absolutely no doubt they'll come back in great runs just like they were pre-1850. So the solutions technically are very simple, but they're not simple in terms of what people would have to give up. I would say anybody that says that seals and sea lions, anything else, needs to be culled because they're eating more than their share or more than fishermen, that's a political call. That's not a scientific one.
If you're looking for that to, quote, solve the problem, bring back salmon, not going to happen. But the fact of life is, I mean, those are all political decisions. Uh, the fishermen are going to get the fish, or the sea lions or the seals are going to get the fish, or the bears are going to get the fish, or they're going to die in an irrigated field someplace. Those are political decisions. Technically, they're all solvable. It's a question whether you want to do it. And <clears throat> it's a very difficult one because, first of all, transport with fishways, there's two issues with transport. The first issue is when the salmon spawn or they're released from hatcheries upriver, uh, they're bar typically they're barged down. So they are transported down around the dams now going downstream. The other question is, is there more efficient ways to get fish around the dams other than the fishways? Uh, people have looked at this an awful lot and the expense is probably prohibitive. There's a lot, there are a lot of fish that go up, mostly hatchery fish, but there are a lot of fish that go up. So it would be a major, major engineering uh, effort to capture those and move them around the dams. And the other thing is how natural is that? I mean, you, at some point you just say, hey, you essentially have farmed fish. If you've got to build a fishway, concrete fishway, you've got to transport them around and to avoid a dam, you just say, well, why not just grow them in pens? I mean, essentially you've got a very altered environment. And are Canadian fisheries managed competently currently? And have they been managed competently in the past 20 years or so? Yeah, <coughs> uh, I'm a, actually a Canadian citizen, so I've got to be careful, otherwise I'll be deported. <laughs> Deported to the U.S. Anyway, uh, <coughs> um, I think I mean most of my, a lot of my colleagues work for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada. I think the situation there is just like it is in the U.S. The choices aren't pleasant, and so whether they're good or bad, well managed or not, is really a function of what your policy goals are. If your goal is wild fish, a lot of people are going to say they're not managed well. But the alternatives are very very undesirable for a lot of segments of society, and it's the same for the U.S. The, the technical aspects of it are relatively simple. The trade-offs are not. So when you say good or bad management, it depends on what you're looking for. This is Ernie Brandon here. To believe that wild salmon and steelhead will recover and provide a semblance of historic harvest fisheries in the face of growing human population is fantasy. Yeah. This issue is a long time in coming. It'll be a long time of being resolved. There's a lot of little pieces. The effects are cumulative. They basically involve everything that humans do, which is nothing wrong with that, but there is a trade-off. And until those things are changed overall, the long-term trajectory will be exactly the same as happened the other three places on the planet where salmon runs originally occurred. They've died out in the areas when you have pop human population goes up, salmon population goes down. The one wrinkle on it is, is that you can sustain salmon runs through hatcheries. Well, you can't do that with most other species.